بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته back with our course through the journey of learning how to pray and uh, we're taking it from the book أمدة الفقه of the great Imam Ibn Qudam al Maqdisi رحمة الله عليه the last thing we took with our author our author our Imam was when he mentioned the sentence وَيَجْعَلُ نَظْرَهُ إِلَى مَوْضِئِ سُجُودِهِ that the person should look to the place when they are standing the prayer the place where they look to and they concentrate on is the point of where they would make sujood so we took this and we spoke about that and we, we mentioned a reason for that and this sentence that we're going to start with today is where the author says ثُمَّ يَقُولُ سُبْحَانَكَ اللَّهُمَّ وَبِحَمْدِكَ وَتَبَارَكَ اسْمُكَ وَتَعَالَ جَدُّكَ وَلَا إِلَهَ غَيْرُكَ So this is a sunnah dua that needs to be said at the beginning of the prayer. After the person has made the takbir of al-ihram, the first takbir, they say this dua. It's sunnah to say so. It's known as dua al-istiftah, the dua of opening the salah. So what I want to do is just look at basic meanings of this dua. So the first word, subhanaka Allahumma. So we're saying, oh Allah, we declare that you are free from any imperfections and you are complete in everything which is about you and perfect. So when we say the word subhan, whether it's subhanallah or subhanallah al-azim, any type of subhan, we're saying that we are freeing you Allah azawajal, we are stating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have no naqs, you have no imperfections whatsoever and you are complete and perfect in everything about you. Wabihamdika, the next word Wabihamdika, we are saying that we are praising you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we praise you for everything that you give to us and all of the perfection which is with you. That's why we praise you. Watabaraka smuk and blessed blessings are attained with your name. Your name is blessed and blessings are attained with your name. In the hadith, the Prophet said, Kullu amrin di balin la yubda umbi bismillah fa huwa abtar that every uh, issue which is of importance that doesn't stay with, start with the Bismillah, with the Basmallah, then it is devoid of blessings. And Shaykh Ibn Baz, alayhi, he said that this hadith is Hassan li ghayrihi. This hadith is authentic, it's an, entire, it's an authentic hadith. Wa ta'ala jadduka. And the word wa ta'ala jadduka, meaning that Allah, your power is most supreme and most high. None can move without your permission and all can de be defeated with you. Wala ilaha ghayruk. There is none to be worshipped in truth besides you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ma'bud bi haq illa Allah. There is none to be worshipped in truth without except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this wala ilaha ghayruk is the reality and the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent all of the messengers to teach the people this fact. So Allah says in the Quran, for example, in Surah Al-Nahl, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنْ يَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَجَتَانِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ Verily, we sent to every nation and to every people a messenger that they should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and leave alone all those that are worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and taken as gods besides Allah azza wa jal. So the wording, the, the phrase, وَلَا إِلَهَا غَيْرُكْ is an establishment of Tawheed, expressing that none has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this is, as I mentioned, it's the dua al-istiftah, it's the opening dua, and it's sunnah. It's not obligatory, it's recommended. And there's many other duas that one can say in place of this dua if they wish to do so. And it's good and it's healthy to try to memorize more than one dua. Why? There's many reasons. From the reasons to ulama, they say, one of them is that the sunnah is preserved through us learning many du'as. Why? Because if we were all to learn only one du'a and stick to only one du'a, then all of the other adi'a, all of the other uh, du'as, they will be lost, they will be forgotten. And also another benefit is the more du'as that you learn, the more interactive you are with your prayer, the less likely you are to become bored and mechanical when you are praying because you have more than one du'a to say uh, for each salah. The author he mentions, ثُمَّ يَقُولُ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ The person is recommended, it's mustahab, 
that they say after the dua is tiftah after the opening dua they say oh allah we seek refuge in you from the shay from the cursed shaytan min shaytan ar rajim a'udhu billah we seek refuge i seek refuge with you oh allah min shaytan from the shaytan ar rajim the one who is cursed and far away from allah's mercy in surah al nahl allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fa idha qara'tu al quran fasta'id billahi min shaytan ar rajim when you read the Quran, and Surah Al-Fatiha is from the Quran that we're going to read in the prayers. When you read the Quran, then seek refuge in Allah from the accursed shaitan. Okay, as in mentioned in Surah Al-Nahl. So this seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the whisperings of shaitan and from the interference of shaitan, it's at the beginning of the prayer and not for every rak'ah. However, it may be said elsewhere in the salah if there is a reason for that to happen. For example, you have in the hadith of Sahih Muslim where Uthman ibn Abi al-As shaka ila Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anna shaytan hala bayna wa bayna salatihi that this blessed companion Uthman ibn Abi al-As radiyallahu anhu he complained to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once that the shaytan was interfering with him and his salat coming between him and the concentration in his salat. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that ka shaytan yuqalu lahu khanzib that is the shaitan which is named Khanzab. So if you feel his presence, uh, then seek Allah's refuge from him. And then spit lightly to your left three times. So you spit lightly without actually bringing out any much saliva. Like this to your left three times. So you don't want to soak the person that is next to you when you're praying. Uh, you just do it enough to make the action. So this is something you can do if you are having lots of whisperings in your prayer and lots of interference from the devil, from the shaitan. The author, he says, may Allah have mercy upon him, ثُمَّ يَقْرَأُ Then the person after having sought refuge with Allah, ثُمَّ يَقْرَأُ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ Then the person before he recites the Surah Al-Fatiha, it's recommended for him, it's mustahab, that the person says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Wala Yajharu bi Shayin min Dalik. And the person, the Imam, when leading the Salah, doesn't say this out loudly. So if the person is leading the Salah, they don't say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim loudly. Because Anas radiallahu anhu, as in Sahih Muslim, he said, Salaytu khalf al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa abi bakr, wa umar, wa uthman, falam asma ahadam minhum, yajharu bi Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Anas radiallahu anhu, he said, I prayed behind the Prophet sallallahu as also I prayed behind Abu Bakr and, Uthman, and Umar and Uthman, may Allah have mercy upon them. And I never heard any one of them recite the Basmala, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, loudly in the Salah. The author, he says, ثُمَّ يَقْرَأُ الْفَاتِحَةِ And then the person goes ahead and they read Surah Al-Fatiha. After seeking refuge in Allah from the Shaitan, after saying the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, they go ahead and they re recite the Surah Al-Fatiha and this is a pillar, it's a rukan. And we already explained in the previous lesson what a rukan is in the Salah. A rukan in the Salah is that action that has to be there if it's left out, whether intentionally left out or left out forgetfully. In both cases, the Salah would be invalid with the absence of this rukan. So Surah Al-Fatiha is a rukan for the Imam, if the Imam is leading, and also for the Munfarid. The Munfarid is the one that is praying by themselves. So in both these situations, Surah Al-Fatiha is a rukan. And it's imperative for us to learn how to recite Surah Al-Fatiha properly with, an, with a qualified teacher because um, if we make mistakes, some of the mistakes can be serious, like we leave out a shadda in the Surah Al-Fatiha, which means that we've left out a letter, or we mispronounce some of the letters which can change the meaning. And this is something which shouldn't be done, so we need to take out the time to find a teacher, to find an instructor that can instruct us uh, over a year or so to perfect as much as possible our recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha. Now some of the meanings of Surah Al-Fatiha that we can reflect upon and it's important to do this because the whole point of learning how to pray is not only knowing the mechanical motions, the movements and what to do but also reflecting upon the meanings. So we're going to take a few of the uh, basic meanings inshallah of Surah Al-Fatiha. So we start with Alhamdulillah and one of the mistakes people make when they recite the Alhamd, they make a Qalqala on the Al. So they say Allah. So they say Alhamdulillah. We're not supposed to say that. We say Alhamdulillah. So anyway, the meaning of Hamd is 
the meaning of this word which is translated normally as praise Alhamdulillah that all praise belongs to Allah it has two meanings one of them it has the meaning of shukr which means thanks and the other meaning of alhamd is the meaning of thana which is praise so shukr thanks is that we are thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the many numerous continual blessings that he showers upon us in every moment of our life and in order to try to bring it to our minds the reality of the blessings that we are in we should for a moment from time to time imagine living in the shoes of those people that have hardly any food for the day that don't have shelter that don't have safety that don't have you know a good state of mind so many people are being trialed with so much in life yet we are here happy healthy everything provided for we sleep in peace and security we should really think about those that don't have the more we think about the, those that don't have the more our hearts will be overcome with gratitude and love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the continual blessings that he showers upon us regularly and this is why the Prophet sallallahu said in the hadith in Tirmidhi انظروا إلى من هو أسفل منكم ولا تنظروا إلى من هو فوقكم فذلك أجدروا ألا تزدروا نعمة الله عليكم the Prophet ﷺ gave us this very important advice. He said, look to the ones who are below you in the status in the world and don't look to those who are above you. For that is going to be better for you in terms of recognizing the blessings and favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. So this word, alhamdulillah, all praise belongs to Allah. We said that the first of the meanings of it is that it has shukr, is that it has the meaning of thanks. Now the second meaning in alhamdulillah is the meaning of al-thana. Al-thana is to praise Allah and to extol His virtues. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most perfect, the most beautiful. Everything that He does is perfect and with perfection. So even if it was the case, which it can never be the case, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not provide for us, even if it was the case that Allah gave us nothing, then we would still say Alhamdulillah. We would still praise Allah. Why? Because He is deserving of praise. Because He's perfect and beautiful and everything he does is with beauty and perfection so that's why we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so then after saying alhamdulillah we say rabb rabbul alamin alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin we say rabb al alamin rabb the meaning rabb is god the lord and it has the meaning of the one that nurtures and provides the needs continually for the creation so the rabb alludes to what is known as Tawheed al rububiyyah a category of Tawheed known as Tawheed al rububiyyah that Allah is the creator, He is the provider and He is the one that controls all affairs. So Rabb is the one that nurtures and provides the needs and controls all of the affairs of His creation. al alamin is everything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kullu mawjood siwa Allah azza wa jalla. Everything which is besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the trillions and trillions of creations that Allah has created besides Himself. And to imagine that Allah has created so much, yet He takes care of every single one of those creations, trillions upon trillions. And He knows their needs and He provides their needs and He's, una he's able to be aware of every single one of them at each time and each place. Then we have Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the most gracious, the most merciful. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful in ways that we cannot comprehend. His mercy extends to all of His creation, His rahmah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continually being merciful to His creation, whether they are Muslim or non-Muslim. And when we reflect upon the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how He loves to forgive the sins of His slaves, then we gravitate towards Him more and more subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more we read about the mercy of Allah subhanahu and the more we reflect upon the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more our hearts gravitate to Allah azza wa jal through love and hope and hoping to be with Allah azza wa jal. So Ar-Rahman is the, the one who is described as being the most merciful. And Ar-Rahim is the one that has specific mercy to the believers in the hereafter. So this is one of the differences between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, though both of them entail that Allah azza wa jal is um, unlimitedly merciful. But one of the differences between Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, Ar-Rahman is that Allah is merciful to all of his creation, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslim in this world. And Ar-Rahim is specific mercy for the believers in the hereafter. 
then we say after saying Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim we say Maliki Yawm Al-Din Maliki Yawm Al-Din Malik is the owner Yawm Al-Din the day of judgment the day of recompense so Allah is the owner of everything in every time and every place so then one might think then why is Allah specifying here Maliki Yawm Al-Din that Allah is the owner of the day of judgment if we already know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is of the owner and the sole controller of everything in every time in every place why does Allah do this to specify and to remind the people who become arrogant in this earth and they think that they can get away without worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they think that they can oppress they think that they don't have to submit to the commands and the guidance of Allah azza wa jal Allah is reminding them that on the day of judgment they will stand before him and they will have no help no power and no protector between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah says for example in um, the hadith in Bukhari the Prophet sallallahu said about Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gather the earth and he will roll up the heavens in his right hand I am the king meaning I am the true king where are those that were kings in the earth and they thought themselves too arrogant so the reason Allah says Maliki Yawm din is to remind us that on that day, on the day of judgment, nobody will own anything. All they will have is their deeds, their good deeds. If they had any at all, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us safety on that day. Ameen. And Yawm din is the day of recompense, the day when everybody will see their deeds, the day when everybody will have to account for their deeds, whether they were minor deeds or major deeds. Anything that you did from good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for and he will increase from his bounty and anything that you did from evil. If Allah hadn't forgiven you, Allah would take you to account uh, out of justice, out of his justice for those, for those sins. Then we say, Iyaka na'budu. Iyaka You alone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we worship. So in the language, linguistically, it should be na'budu iyak, the opposite of what we recite. But the reason we say Iyaka na'budu, you alone we worship, we put the you before the worship. So normally in language you say um, we worship you, the pronoun you would come after the verb. But here in Surah Al-Fatiha we are saying Iyaka na'budu, you we worship. So the verb comes after the pronoun you. The reason this is done because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is making what is known as takhsis. Peculiar, um, not peculiarity, Allah is specifying that worship is to Him alone and to nobody else besides Allah Azawajal. So worship is always only given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody else can share in that worship besides Allah Azawajal. And worship, as the scholars have described, is ismu jami' li kulli ma yuhibbuhu Allahu yantahu min al aqwal wal a'mal al dahirat wal batina. Worship is a comprehensive word a comprehensive noun which covers everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and is pleased with from the outer actions and the inner actions whether they are statements or actions again you alone we rely upon Allah you alone we rely upon it's the anna, reliance of the heart upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we rely upon Allah in seeking the goodness of life and seeking protection from any harm in life because this is an act of worship which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and Allah loves that we recognize that nothing can be given to us except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah loves that we recognize and appreciate that no harm can be prevented from us except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the more the person feels this in his, in his heart the more he will turn away from magnifying the creation and he will alone or she will alone instead magnify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, uh, and glorify Allah azza wa jal in, in that person's heart and soul and only be attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is from the greatest of the acts of worship that a person can do to rely upon Allah azza wa jal alone. The Prophet sallallahu said in the hadith in Tirmidhi to Ibn Abbas radiyallahu anhu Ya ghulam inni u'alimuka kalimat Oh young boy, he said to Ibn Abbas, this companion when he was young I'm going to teach you some words So he taught him at the, around, they say, the age of maybe 10, 12 
So you can imagine that these words that I'm about to mention now were taught by the Prophet Sallallahu to a young person. And they are such tremendous words that should be taught from a young age and should be continually reflected upon until we die. So the Prophet Sallallahu said to him, Ihfad Allah, Yahfadka. Preserve the limits of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, and Allah will preserve you and protect you. Ihfad Allah tajid hu tajahak. Preserve the limits of Allah Azza wa Jal and you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always in front of you. إِذَا سَأَلْتَ فَاسْأَلِ اللَّهِ Whenever you ask, then ask alone from Allah Azza wa Jal. وَإِذَا اسْتَعَنْتَ فَاسْتَعِنْ بِاللَّهِ And when you rely upon, when you want to rely upon somebody, then rely only upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ الْأُمَّ لَوْ اجْتَمَعَتْ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يَنْفَعُكَ بِشَيْءٍ لَمْ يَنْفَعُكَ بِشَيْءٍ إِلَّا قَدْ كَتَبَهُ اللَّهُ لَكَ and know and have certainty that if all of the creation was to gather together together, was to gather together at one time to try to benefit you with something, they wouldn't be able to benefit with you. They wouldn't be able to benefit you except for that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decreed and written for you. And if they were together to, to gather together, uh, as one body to try and harm you, they wouldn't be able to harm you with anything except that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already written for you. Rufi'at al-Iqlam wa Jufat al-Suhf The pens have been lifted and the pages have become dry, meaning that the decree of Allah azza wa jal, the qadr, the predestination has already taken place. So this hadith, it reminds us that nothing will happen except by the permission of Allah azza wa jal. Nothing good can come to us and no protection comes to us except by way of Allah So we, when we say You, O Allah, we rely upon solely We should understand it through the meaning of this hadith and other information Then in Surah Fatiha, Fatiha we say Ihdina sirat al mustaqim O Allah, guide us, ihdina, guide us Sirat al mustaqim To the straight path Guide us to the sirat which is path and mustaqim straight oh Allah guide us to the straight path so you may wonder you're already a Muslim you've already been guided to Islam why are you saying ihdina sirat al mustaqim because the continual attacks of shaitan are with us until the moment we die we need to feverishly beg Allah to continue to guide us and because the nature of our hearts and the word heart in Arabic is qalb qalb summi al qalb li annahu yataqallab the qalb it was given the name qalb because it jumps from state to state. It jumps from emotion to emotion. One minute you're upon guidance, one minute you're upon misguidance. One minute you're happy, one minute you're sad. So that's the nature of the heart. It's always moving around. So we continually beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like the Prophet sallallahu used to do so. And he was the most closest to Allah, yet he would beg Allah for him to be guided. Ya muqallib al-qalub, thabbit qalbi ala deenik. He would say, oh, the one who tends the hearts, Make my heart firm upon your faith and upon your religion. So we need to continually beg Allah Azza wa Jal for guidance to the, upon the straight path. And Imam Ahmad, the great Imam of Ahl Sunnah, when he was dying, he was on his deathbed. His son Abdullah ibn Imam Ahmad, his son Abdullah, uh, noticed that his father was saying, whilst in the stupors of death, whilst coming in and out of consci consciousness on his deathbed, la ba'd, la ba'd. He was saying, not yet, not yet. And when his father came to consciousness for a few moments, his son asked him, he said, Oh, Abati, yeah, my father, I'm so worried for you that I'm saying to you, La ilaha illallah, and you are saying, Not yet, not yet. So his father explained to him, No, my son, it's not what you think. Rather, I saw the devil, and the devil was standing in front of me, biting his fingers, saying, Oh, Ahmed, you have escaped my plots. And Imam Ahmed said, Not yet, not yet, not until my soul leaves my body. And that's the reality, that the shaitan, the devil, he doesn't leave us until our souls leave our body. He will continue to try to misguide us. So the more we beg Allah Azza wa for guidance, the more we understand how important it is to seek guidance from Allah, ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, the more Allah Azza wa will give us that guidance. Sirat al-mustaqim, as I alluded to, is the straight path. The straight path is Islam. And we will stay upon Islam as we as long as we continue to beg Allah Azza wa Jal, number one, for guidance and assistance, and number two, to be in close contact with the Quran and the Sunnah, as understood by the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu and the rightly guided scholars that came after them. So we have to try to have a deep knowledge 
of the Quran and the knowledge of the Sunnah, the statements and actions of the Prophet وسلم, as understood by his companions, who his students, and then those scholars who came after them. So the more we learn about that, the more we will stay upon the Sirat, the Sirat al Mustaqim. The next statement in the Surah Al Fatiha is Sirat al Ladina and Amta Alayhim, the path of those that you had blessed. So what is the straight path? It's the path of those that you had blessed from the companions and from all of the righteous that follow them in their way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alludes to this in the Quran, in Surah An-Nisa, where he says, وَمَن يُطِعِ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْأَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِّيِّينَ وَصِدِّقِينَ وَشُهَدَاءِ وَصَالِحِينَ وَحَسُّنَا أُولَٰئِكَ رَفِيقًا Those who obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Messenger, then certainly they are with those that Allah Azza wa Jalla had favored and blessed them from the prophets and the truthful and the martyrs and the righteous righteous ones uh, and they are the best of companions so when you say Sirat al-ladina and amta alayhim oh Allah guide me to the path of those that you favored before me you are asking to be guided like the prophets were guided like the truthful were guided like the martyrs were guided like the companions of the Prophet وسلم, were guided, etc. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَلْضَالِينَ Not the way of those that you are angry with or the way of those that have been misguided. The ones that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's anger is upon are those from the uh, nation of the Jews who had the truth but they put that truth behind them. They, they changed the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that came to them in the Torah and they put it behind their backs. So anyone that behaves in the same way whether he's a Muslim or a non-Muslim, guidance comes to them. However, they avoid that guidance or they uh, misinterpret and misrepresent the guidance, then they also have the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them. Then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, um, nor those who have been misguided. The misguided ones are referring to those Christians who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without having a reference, without having um, true tradition. Because as we know that the Bible has become corrupt and when you ask a Christian as to why do you do this act of worship, they don't really have any true source to prove why they do a particular act of worship. So any Muslim that does an act of worship without having a proof or guidance for why they do the act of worship, then they are resembling those whom Allah has mentioned in that verse, that those who have become misguided. The author he says, وَلَا صَلَاةَ لِمَنْ لَمْ يَقْرَأَ بِهِ There is no prayer for the one that does not recite the Surah Al-Fatiha. And again, this is for the Imam or the Munfarid, the one who is leading the prayer or the one that is praying by themselves. So it's a Rukn. And this is based in the Hadith in Bukhari where the Prophet ﷺ said, لَا صَلَاةَ لِمَنْ لَمْ يَقْرَأَ بِفَاتِحَةِ الْكِتَابِ There is no prayer for the one that does not recite the Fatiha of the book, meaning Surah Al-Fatiha. And the negation of the validity of the prayer in this hadith shows that reading Surah Al-Fatiha is a rukan, as we've mentioned. The author gives an exception. He says, Except for the ma'mum, except for the one who is praying behind the imam, then this person doesn't have to pray the Surah Al-Fatiha. It's not a rukan for him because the recitation of his or her imam would be a recitation for him or her. Why? Because in the hadith collected by Ibn Majah, authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani, alayhi, the Prophet وسلم, said, Man kana lahu al-imam, qira'atul imam lahu qira'a. Whoever has an imam, then the recitation of his imam will be for him a recitation, meaning suffices him as a recitation. And this is whether the prayer is a loud prayer, or a quiet prayer. So if you're praying behind the Imam, you don't recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Okay? It's not, a, um, it's not something which is obligatory upon you to do. The author, he says, وَيُسْتَحَبُّ أَنْ يَقْرَأَ فِي سَكَتَاتِ الْإِمَامِ However, he said, it's recommended to pray in the quiet pauses of the Imam. If you have an Imam that pauses after reciting Surah Al-Fatiha before reciting a Surah, then in that pause, you can recite the Surah Al-Fatiha. Okay, it's, a, it's recommended for you to do so. If your Imam, excuse me, if your Imam has a pause. وَمَا لَا يَجْهَرُوا فِيهِ And also, 
in the places, in the, in the parts of the prayer where the Imam doesn't recite loudly, it's recommended for you to recite also. For example, if you recite a Dhuhr or Asr, those are quiet prayers where the Imam doesn't recite loudly, it's recommended for you to recite Surah Al-Fatiha quietly to yourself. And also in Maghrib, in the third rak'ah, and in the last two rak'ah of uh, Isha, when the Imam is quiet, reciting quietly, it's recommended for you also to recite Surah Al-Fatiha quietly. But as we said, however, it's not something which is obligatory. Also, as an extra point, it's recommended for you to recite if you are praying behind the Imam, but you cannot hear what the Imam is reciting due to, being, uh, due to there being lots of loud noise around you. So if you cannot hear what the, uh, the Imam is reciting due to there being lots of noise around you, then in that situation you can also recite the Surah Al-Fatiha. But not due to the fact that you are far away from the Imam. If you are far away from the Imam due to distance and you can't hear the Imam reciting, then in this situation you don't recite. But you recite if you can't hear the Imam due to noise, as mentioned by uh, the Hanbali scholars. The author, he says, ثُمَّ يَقْرَأُوا صُورَةً تَكُونُوا فِي الصُّبْحِ مِنْ طِوَالِ المفصل. The author is now going to give some advice as to what's recommended for us to recite in the prayer. Recommended, mustahab, istihbab, not obligatory. So the author, he says, it's recommended for you to recite in the morning prayer from the long surahs which are known as al-mufassal, the separated surahs. These surahs, surah, 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 surah al-mufassal, uh, are known as the surahs from Surah al-Qaf until Surah al-Nas. Okay? The mufassal, this range of surahs in the Quran called Mufassal are from Surah Al-Qaf to Surah Al-Nas and the Tiwal, the long of these surahs which the author is referring to here to be recited to in the morning prayer, in the Fajr prayer are from Surah Al-Qaf to Surah Al-Naba'a وَفِي الْمَغْرِبِ مِنْ قِصَارِهِ and the author recommends that for in Maghrib we recite from the Qisar of these Mufassal the Qisar, the short of these surahs, of this group of surahs is from uh, Surah Al-Duha into Surah Al-Nas وَفِي سَائِرِ صَلَوَاتِ مِنْ أَوْسَاطِهِ and in all of the other prayers then we recite from the middle of these surahs which is Surah Al-Naba to Surah Al-Duha any of these surahs from Naba to Duha and again this is something which is recommended you can recite any part of the Quran that you wish to do so in your Salah and it's not something which is obligatory upon you and in fact you can even uh, avoid if you wanted to for whatever reason uh, reciting a surah after the salah because all of that is something which is recommended in sunnah and there's nothing upon you if you were to leave that out what's obligatory upon you if you're the imam or the munfarid uh, as we mentioned is to recite surah al-fatiha the author may Allah have mercy upon him he says that uh, imam when he's reciting uh, he's leading the prayer or she's leading the prayer in the morning prayer, in the first, in the morning prayer, and also in the first two rak'ah of Maghrib and Isha, the person recites loudly. So you would recite this Surah Al-Fatiha loudly, and you would recite the Surah of the Surah Al-Fatiha loudly. Wa yusirru fi ma adadalik, and in other than that, meaning other than the two rak'ahs of Fajr, and the first two rak'ahs of Maghrib, and the first two rak'ahs of Isha, other than those. Raka'at, other than those units of prayers, you would recite quietly, okay? And if a person is an imam and they are leading the prayer and they were supposed to have recited loudly, as we mentioned, like in Fajr or in the first two raka'ats of Maghrib and Isha, but then the person forgot, there's no prostration or forgetfulness upon them if they had forgotten to recite loudly and they instead recited quietly. They don't have to make the Prostration, sajuda sahwa, prostration of forgetfulness. Uh, it's not legislated for them to do so in this situation. Now, if a person is an imam and they mix up, like for example, when they were supposed to recite quietly, they recited loudly. And when they were supposed to recite loudly, they recited quietly. Also, in this situation, there's nothing upon them because, again, we said the reciting loudly is a sunnah, it's something which is recommended. And if one uh, we'll leave that point, inshallah. We'll move on. The author he says, ثُمَّ يُكَبِّرُ وَيَرْكَعُونَ After having recited Surah Al-Fatiha and recited a surah, the, per the person makes the ruku after making the takbir. The person makes the takbir, Allahu Akbar, and goes into the ruku, 
into the bow, into the bowing prostration, uh, the bowing position while standing, which is known as a ruku. وَيَرْفَعُ يَدَيْهِ كَرَفْعِهِ الْأَوْلِ And they, the person raises their hands as they did in the first takbir. So when you go into the ruku, you say Allahu Akbar, and you go into the ruku. Okay. So the ruku itself is a pillar. To go into the position of the ruku is a pillar of the salah, and to raise your hands is a sunnah. So saying Allahu Akbar as you move into that position is a ruku, but the raising of your hand is a sunnah. All of the takbirat after the first takbir, um, after the first takbir in the salah, are wajib, are something which is obligatory, but they are not rukan. Okay? All of the sayings of Allahu Akbar in the prayer are wajib, except for the first one, the opening takbir, that's a rukan. Okay? And these takbirat are known as takbiratul intiqal, the takbirat, the takbirs of moving from one position to the next position which shows us that the ulama say that it shouldn't be said at the beginning of the position nor at the end of the position. You say it in between the two positions. You say it between the position you have left until the position you are going to. So when you are standing up and you're going to, into ruku, you say Allahu Akbar. You don't say Allahu Akbar and then move, nor do you move into the ruku and then say Allahu Akbar. You say it between the beginning of the position to the next to the beginning of the next position. Okay, you say it from the position you are leaving, which is standing, uh, uh, until you reach the next position. Allahu Akbar. The author, he says, And the person puts his or her hands upon their knees. This is something which is sunnah. To put your hands upon your knees, okay? It's sunnah. If you wanted to put them anywhere else because you're a weirdo, you could go ahead and do so. But that's not the th something that you should do. You should follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. However, it's not obligatory. So you put your hands upon your knees. And you open your fingers. on your. You, you grab your knees with your uh, fingers open. The position of the hand uh, everywhere else in the prayer requires that your fingers be together. But in this situation, when you are making the ruku, the, um, the bowing, while standing, you put your hands on your knees recommended with your fingers open. And you extend your back. And you put your head at the same level as your back. So your head shouldn't be down, nor should it be going up. It should be as straight as possible with your back when you are in the ruku. The Prophet ﷺ, in the hadith collected by Imam Ibn Majah, and others, the hadith of Wasiba ibn Ma'bad, he said, Ra'itu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi I saw the Prophet sallallahu pray. Fakana ida raka'a, fakana ida raka'a, sawwa dahrahu, hatta law subba alayhi ma lastaqar. So the Prophet sallallahu used to, when he would make this um, bowing, the ruku, he would straighten his back to the extent that if you were to put water on his back, the water would stay in position. It wouldn't run off because his back would be so straight. So this is something which is sunnah for us to do, that we should straighten our back as much as possible. And the ulama, they said that the, the in hina, the bowing that is required, is to the extent that it shows that you're not standing. Meaning that you should be closer to the position of ruku than standing. That's what's obligatory upon you. That you are closer to the position of ruku than you are standing. To the extent that a normal person, uh, their hands, could touch their knees. We're not talking about a person with super long arms like orangutans. We're talking about a normal person that they need to bow down in the ruku to the extent that the hands can touch their knees. Okay? But as we said, your hands don't have to be on your knees, but as close as possible so that you could do that. Um, the author, he says, ثُمَّ يَقُولُ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّيَ الْعَظِيمُ And then the person says, سُبْحَانَ رَبِّيَ الْعَظِيمُ in the ruku, in the position of ruku. The person says this dhikr, subhana rabbi al azim and it's recommended that they say it three times, but obligatory, wajib, obligatory is to say it once. Recommended to say it three, but obligatory you have to say it once. Subhana rabbi al azim What does it mean? Again, subhan means that we are freeing Allah, we are declaring that Allah is free of all imperfection. Rabbi, my Lord, al azim the adjective, the description, which means the greatest, the powerful, the mighty. So Allah is Al-Azim. So in this position of the ruku, 
you should reflect upon Allah's greatness and that you are standing before him submitting to his greatness the Prophet said in the hadith collected by Imam Abi Dawood he said the Prophet said I was given permission by Allah to describe one of the angels that carry the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said the Prophet وسلم, said verily between the position of the heir of this angel until the shoulder of this angel is a journey of 700 years so you can imagine that there's eight of these angels carrying the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and just the description of what is between the air to the shoulder of one of the angels is a distance that would be traveled of 700 years you can imagine how magnificent this creation is and then on top of that how magnificent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so we should feel the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this position in fact the Prophet sallallahu mentioned in other narrations which are authentic that everything which is in the creation everything that we know to be in existence and that we don't know of that Allah has created in comparison to the kursi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the kursi as mentioned by Ibn Abbas is the place the footstool of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where Allah azawajal places his feet and when we describe anything about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we always remember that Allah is perfect and whatever comes to our mind Allah azawajal Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is way beyond that in his attributes and descriptions so the footstool of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in comparison to all of the creation the Prophet said is like this all of the creation is like a ring which is thrown into a desert the desert is relating to the description of the footstool the footstool is the desert and all of the creation is a ring so you can imagine the vastness and the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when we say subhanahu rabbi al azim we should try to bring some of these meanings to mind and recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest and um, there are other adhkar there are other dhikrs that we can say in, in the ruku subuh al qudus rabbul mulaikati wa ruhi and others so we can say subhanahu we say subhan rabbi al azim once that is obligatory and to say more than once is sunnah and like we said in the beginning with regards to the opening dua of the prayer it's good to learn different uh, adhkar, different remembrances because this helps you to stay active in the prayer and not to become bored and it, uh, it's good to preserve the sunnah also uh, I'm going to stop here and anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and shaitan we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us knowledge that will help us to come close to him to give us knowledge which is based upon the Quran and the sunnah as understood by the righteous salaf and to make us from those who act upon what we learn